Hello friends. Today I am going to discuss something about RH isomerization during pregnancy. This is not a lecture on RH isomerization or fetal anemia, but some practical tips on managing such cases. Even hydrosphetalis results when maternal sensitization occurs typically after first pregnancy with an RH positive partner. However, the clinical presentation of subsequent pregnancy will depend upon avidity of the antibody that is avidity of the maternal immune apparatus to the new antibody that has come into the circulation, what is the antibody load and RH status of the new fetus. If it is an RH negative fetus, then it to basic pregnancy may not present with immune hydrosphetalis. So the first step of assessing such an RH negative pregnancy is to do booking IDCT at 12th week. And if the IDCT test comes as positive, we know this patient is sensitized. There is no, lo it, there is no longer use of doing repeat IDCTs, but then shift our focus to looking at MCA peak systolic velocity for early diagnosis of fetal anemia. If the booking IDCT is negative, then we know this is a non-sensitized pregnancy and she will require a repeat test at 28th week and injection anti-D if she is negative. Some practical points about booking IDCT is that we should test even the primary gravidus because the previous pregnancies may not be disclosed to the doctor. Second, do not do IDCT after 28th week. If she has received anti-D, the test will come as false positive. There are two different techniques of doing IDCT. The most common is saline agglutination and this gives us, gives the results in the titus which we, with which we are familiar with like 1 s to 2, 1 s to 4, 1 s to 8. But this is a manual process requiring serial dilatation, di dilution and it's prone for mistakes. It will also be false negative if the mother has got a low antibody load or a very high antibody load. Gel car technique on the other hand is a simple reliable test which is reproducible, stable with an increased sensitivity and it does not require washing. However, gel card reports will come into grades like 4 plus, 3 plus, 2 plus, 1 plus, 2 which we are not used to. We remember that any way we are doing the IDCT, if the test comes as positive, we know there is a sensitization. That IDCT has served its purpose of identifying a woman who is sensitized versus a woman who is not sensitized. How do we diagnose sensitization is to look into the past history factors such as previous head drops or patient did not receive anti-D. In current pregnancy, sometimes the IDCT may come positive, but most common clinical scenario is an unexpected finding on ultrasound where the patient baby shows head drops and a raised MCA. For example, here is a baby which presented at around 26-27 weeks and we can see uh, ascites, there is an hepatomegaly, gross ascites is seen and fluid is seen in two compartments and our diagnosis is of fetal heteros and that it is fetal anemia is seen by looking at the middle cerebral artery with a peak systolic velocity is almost twice the given gestational age. That's an easy thumb rule. So when we look at in combination of ascites with middle cerebral artery PSV raised, then we look at what is the rise. If it is more than 1.5 mom, then we know this is an anemic fetus and we require a IDCT test. If the IDCT test comes positive, then we know this is an anemia, anemic baby and proceed, we proceed for intra-grand blood transfusion. If the mean systolic velocity is less than 1.5 mom, then we know this is not fetal anemia and we need to look for other causes like genetic causes or some unknown causes or viral infections. Before the MCA was introduced, we used to do amniocentesis for bilirubin estimation and this was a indirect way of assessing the level of fetal anemia that is to looking at the bilirubin levels into amniotic fluid and hemolysis leading to bilirubinemia was the reason why we looked at amniotic fluid bilirubin. But today we know MCA is a major vessel because the blood is less viscous, the blood is flowing faster and a higher PSV is correlated well with the fetal hemoglobin levels. Second advantage is the vessel of this studying MCA is that this vessel allows measurement of the velocity without any angle correction. And the 
angle of insulation is close to 0 degrees, thus it improves the reproducibility between various observers. When we start, when we start monitoring such a pregnancy 6 to 8 weeks prior to her previous episode, for example, if she had head drops at 32 weeks, we start monitoring from 24th week. However, we remember that when a previous pregnancy has been complicated by head drops fetalis, then your IDCD titers are less reliable predictors of severe fetal anemia and we should stick to only MCA PSV for serial monitoring. This severity will increase in subsequent pregnancy. Which fetus to treat is a critical decision making which needs which, and we need to understand what is the degree of fetal anemia, the gestational age and the neonatal backup. In our unit, we deliver babies which are beyond 34 weeks and manage these babies. If the baby is hydropic, then it is better to give an intrauterine transfusion and deliver postoperatively and deliver. The postoperative recovery is faster in such babies. However, if the baby is less than 33 weeks, it is better to treat these babies with intrauterine transfusion. The MC peak systolic velocity of more than 1.5 mom correlates well to the severity of anemia if it is immune fetal anemia, but it is not effective if it is not immune and immune fetal anemia. In such cases, presence of fetal ascites as an additional finding correlates well to the severity of fetal anemia. Once we have diagnosed fetal anemia, the first thing is to do an invasive testing and for which we require chordocentesis. But always remember never plan a only diagnostic chordocentesis but prepare the fetus for an intrauterine blood transfusion also. So in our unit, the first step would be to do a diagnostic test, send the blood for testing and start the transfusion again. How do we calculate? Today, many equations are available and one very good equation is provided by perinatology.com and this gives us the amount of blood volume necessary to correct the fetal anemia. If the baby is hydropic, it is worthwhile to remember that cardiac overload should be avoided. In such a situation, it is suggested to convert the baby to convert this anemia from severe state to moderate anemia and plan second transfusion after some time. A pre-procedural workup will require a comprehensive counseling which has to be accurate, current and non-directional using local language and involving other specialities, especially interpreters if the patients have some language problems. And of course, concerns, investigations, prophylactic antibiotics, tocolytics, some discussion about anesthesia and what we call this mock, mock trial. Mock trial is the previous day, the day before planning the intrauterine transfusion, we talk to all our OT assistants, OT brothers and conduct one trial just to see that everything goes smooth. Donor blood required is O negative, we should be fresh with, an plexus, with a PCV of more than 60 and of course the blood banks will look at all these factors of cytomegalo negative, hemoglobin S negative and we need to consider this as a blood transfusion consent and separate consent for this should be obtained benefits considering the benefits risk and using native language sometimes we face a situation where o negative blood may not be available and in such a situation autologous washed maternal blood can also be used for iut once the maternal hemoglobin level is more than 12 grams per cent this eliminates the risk of sensitization to new RBC antigens in the random blood donor. We need a quiet fetus and that's the reason fetal paralysis is important. Paralysis will induce, reduce the risk of cord complications such as arterial spasm, hematoma or excessive bleeding, all of which can result from needle dislodgement with fetal movement. Look at this baby which is not at all cooperative, it's just that the needle is coming into the intrauterine space and was moving so fast and if in such a fetus we attempt an intrauterine transfusion, the needle is definitely going to be dislodged. We remember that the fetus will remain paralyzed for 3 to 4 hours and therefore any CTG is taken in the post-operative period will be erroneously non-reactive. If the baby is hydraulic, the baby takes still more time for the drug to be metabolized because this drug is metabolized in liver and the baby will remain paralyzed for still longer time. The access today is intravascular access where the cord is either entered into the either the cord the cord insertion point if the placenta is anterior or posterior. But today most of the transfusions are given into the intrahepatic portion as shown over here. 
Sometimes, especially if the baby is too small, like less than 20 weeks of gestation where the cord is extremely thin, it is difficult to give an intravascular blood transfusion and we can choose an intraperitoneal route. This acts like a reservoir, also acts like a reservoir after IV correction if we are not able to give entire blood volume in a single shot intravascularly. In such a case, then we would give two thirds dose intravascularly and rest one third doses injected intraperitoneally, which will act like a reservoir and blood will be slowly absorbed. But this is not a good route because there is a poor absorption and it is not possible to assess the effective degree of anemia correction after the blood transfusion. This is a fast forward clip of how an intrauterine transfusion is performed under local anesthesia. The needle is inserted and the first step is to paralyze the baby. Once the fetus is paralyzed, we are introducing a 20 gauge needle into the cord. Luckily, the cord was anterior over here. And we confirm the cord entry into the umbilical vein by injecting 5 cc of normal saline, which should move away towards the fetus. Sometimes, erroneously, the needle may be in an artery and that is not good. We use a three-way connector and a long tubing so that there is no pressure over the needle. To avoid excessive transfusion and polycythemia, approximately two-thirds of the calculated volume should be transfused followed by a fetal blood sampling to determine the final volume needed for IOD. The target would be to reach 17 grams in a non-hydropic fetus. But if this target is not achievable, it is better to do another procedure after some time. At the end of the procedure, the MCA with PSV comes back to the normal and that can be confirmed on table. Intrahepatic route is a preferred route and we perform 70% of our IUTs via intrahepatic route. That's because it is avoidance of arterial puncture and secondary vasospasm and cord tamponade, less fetomaternal bleed. The success rate is almost in the region of 90%. Furthermore, if there is an intraperitoneal bleeding occurs, it is usually self-limiting and functions like an intraperitoneal blood transfusion. We have to be careful in an hydropic fetus where do not raise the hemoglobin or hematocrit more than fourfold in severely anemic hydropic fetuses during a single IOT as this has been found to be predictor of fetal loss. Instead, we will perform a second procedure within 10 days if necessary to reach the target hemoglobin. And this correction of fetal anemia can be observed on table with a drop in the peak systolic velocity in MCA. There are some issues. Fetal bradycardia where the mother, we need to place the mother in a left lateral position. Cord punctures which usually stop over some time. Sometimes there could be cord hematoma. We need to monitor the baby patient with CTG for at least post operatively at least for one hour and if there are any abnormal findings we patient may require admission or discuss emergency cesarean section. I distinctly remember one of the case where the cord was accidentally punctured and because we do all procedures in operation theater setting the patient could be immediately shifted to another OR and emergency cesarean section done. The hemoglobin at the time of delivery was 5 grams per cent. It was an heroic effort on the part of neonatologist to do an immediate blood transfusion and the baby could be saved. But we need to be prepared for a emergency C-section if the baby is beyond age of viability. There are some anxiety moments. Here I was doing a uh, difficult blood transfusion. Initially I tried giving intrahepatic but for some reason the blood the needle could not enter into the hepatic vein. So ultimately because the baby was hydropic, we, I had no other option than to go into the cord. Initial 60 blood, 60 ml of blood could went uneventfully. But then the patient moved and I also moved my eyes were off the screen for a fraction of a second and a needle dislodged the tip came out of the vessel wall and look what happened. There is a puncture and the baby started bleeding back vigorously into the peritoneal cavity, into the amniotic cavity. Remember these babies also have thrombocytopenia and therefore the blood will not clot so easily. And uh, this is a very anxious moment actually, luckily this baby co was cooperative, the heart was well maintained and uh, after some time the bleeding stopped but we need to be prepared for delivery if the baby is viable. 
In subsequent blood transfusions, will MCPSV predict severity? And the answer is no, because the viscosity has changed. And this, in this very good paper, the authors have shown that after first transfusion, the false positive MCA is about 14%. After second transfusion, the false positive rate increases to 37 And after third transfusion, the false positive rate goes to almost 90%. In such a situation, it is always better to observe the rate of decrease in fetal hemoglobin, which is 0.3 grams per deciliter, to calculate the future blood transfer. So, in our unit, we plan first after second transfer after 10 days, then after two weeks and three weeks for second, third, and subsequent intraterminal transfusions. MCA PSV may play some role as in high because it has got a high negative predictive value and therefore could allow subsequent IOTs to be postponed in selective cases. When to deliver and beyond 34-35 weeks, the route of delivery will be C-section if the baby was hydropic because these babies do not tolerate labor, labor process. Keep facility for exchange transfusion ready. Once such a baby is delivered, whether we should monitor or do a prophylactic exchange, that is a big question. Most units will rely on serial bilirubin and exchange, do an exchange if the bilirubin crosses more than 5 mg per deciliter using a Bhutani chart and using a high intensity phototherapy. But we prefer to do a prophylactic exchange immediately following birth. The idea is that such an exchange will remove the sensitized cells, will reduce the level of maternal antibodies, correct the fetal anemia by providing blood replacement and replacement with donor plasma also restores the albumin and any needed coagulation factors. This is our data of last 76 cases and we have divided it into anemic fetuses and hydropic fetuses and we can see from these figures that the success rates of transfusion in anemic fetuses is almost 95%. Well, if the fetus is hydropic, the success rate will drop to 70% and the reason is obvious. It is the underlying hemodynamic intolerance, hemodynamic imbalance that leads to a higher loss rate if the babies were hydropic. In our initial series, we used to do prophylactic phototherapy followed by an exchange as per requirement, but that led to some higher losses rate. But thereafter, we have shifted our focus to prophylactic exchange directly and after that, there has been only one loss in last 43 cases. Some thoughts on NTD, uh, we remember that universal NTD is must to be given at 20 week if the IDCT test is negative. Choose a repeated lab for blood test. We have seen wrong blood group reporting. Prescribe NTD from a good pharmacy. People usually shut down freeze in the night and NTD is a temperature sensitive drug. Use higher dose even in cases of minor amounts of antipartum hemorrhages. Because we cannot evaluate the amount of phytomaternal bleed and some mothers will be highly sensitive to even small amount of transfer that has occurred. Do consider a postpartum higher dose in special cases like twins, MRP or manual remolo placenta, PPH management, abrupt show, even C-sections and because we do not do KB test in India. Ideally, we should look at the KB test for quantification of phytomaternal bleed and this is not a difficult test but because the demand for KB test is very low, pathologists usually refrain from doing this test. So as in local policy, if the local OBG1 society decides that all its members will do KB test in all cases of RH, RH negative mothers, it may become a financially viable test for the pathologist also and they will be interested in doing the test also and probably one in ten women who receives a higher dose of NTD will benefit. RH isolation is a success story of fetal medicine. Better understanding of pathophysiology with the newer non-invasive ways of fetal monitoring have led to a good success rate. And of course, the better equipped NICUs are also helping a lot in saving these babies. Thank you.